Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar on the Windows Mobile End of Life and the Android or Enterprise OS Migration webinar. This is the first webinar in our series of three, and it's the introductory one, where we want to familiar, familiarize all of you with what's happening in the industry right now, the, uh, the shift in the paradigm of how Windows is no longer going to be supported on the CE platforms. Uh, Windows Mobile will no longer be supported as well, and they are shifting into the Android space. So we're going to be concentrating on that at an introductory level today. I'll be presenting. My name is Nick Diagostino. I'm the Product Marketing Manager at Lari Solutions, and also presenting with us is Kevin Lalik, who's the North American Regional Manager and Software Specialist at Zebra. So I'll start by introducing Lowry to those of you who haven't heard of us. Our company has been around for over 40 years. We're a solutions provider. We've had more than 10,000 clients over the years, and we're recognized as being an industry leader with many of our partners, for example, Zebra, who is helping us with this call today. We have a wide portfolio of services that we offer. Uh, anything from RFID, mobile enterprise, uh, mobile device management, staging of devices. We do sell hardware, printers. We sell uh, rugged tablets. Um, all kinds of hardware that's used in the solution selling. So the reason for today's webinar is that a well-traveled path is coming to an end, and it's one that we're all very familiar with, and I don't know that everybody is quite ready for it, and that's that Windows CE is no longer going to be supported beyond 2021. Uh, that goes for all of the Windows CE versions that are for the mobile devices. So what that means for all of you is that you need to upgrade and refresh your equipment uh, with Android compatible devices in order to maintain your applications and maintain your uh, your business flows, um, connections with your ERPs and your workflows uh, within your companies. So these are the drop dead dates for when Windows will no longer be supporting uh, the different versions of Windows CE, Windows Embedded, and the handheld editions for 8.1. So you can see that some of them have already passed. We've already gotten well past the mainstream support, and now we've even gotten past the extended support, which means that Microsoft will no longer be pushing any updates of any kind to any uh, device that's running those operating systems. So if you don't have the latest and greatest patches, there are lots of implications that result from that. A lot of them center around security. Some of them is compatibility between devices, between applications, between ERPs. Uh, and we'll mention those throughout this webinar so you can become more familiar with exactly what can happen, some of the adverse effects, but then also identify some of the opportunities in making the switch to uh, Android operating systems within your enterprise. So this is always the easiest part, right? You just go to your IT manager and you say, hey, I need to get all new devices for the whole entire company. And he said, absolutely. Uh, gives you a blank check and you buy all the devices. But unfortunately, that's not how things work. So you'll probably see a lot of resistance within your organization. A lot of people will claim that the devices are fine, that they don't need an upgrade, that they don't want to, uh, to migrate to an Android operating system for their enterprise mobility devices because it's disruptive. Um, many other people have other priorities, other projects they're working on. They may not place this in their triage on the highest level. Um, many of them, they don't want to reconfigure on the back end some of the apps or some of the customizations that were made to the Windows devices. And I think that leap of faith from going from one operating system in Windows and then jumping to Android, which is Linux-based, can be a little uh, frightening at first, but as you'll see throughout this webinar series, 
we have all the tools that we need to help guide you through that process as your trusted advisor in the enterprise mobility OS migration to Android. So why Zebra Android devices? And first and foremost, the reason for Zebra is because they were way ahead of the curve on this one. They began their partnership with Google uh, to bring Android to their platform years and years ago, whereas some other competitors are just now uh, realizing that Windows is no longer going to be supported for the CE uh, operating systems and the mobile operating systems. So since Zebra had such a head start and they had a lot of collaboration with the developers, they've managed to build a very secure uh, operating system that comes pre-configured with many of the tools that you'll need to assist with your migration. Um, a quick example of one that you'll find useful is anybody who knows how, when you need to set telnet settings to be able to get a device to talk to a, a network, you can configure that and it's prepackaged uh, within the Zebra operating system, or the Android operating system. And we'll get into that in more detail. I know it kind of seems like a lot to take in right now, but as we go through the series webinars, everybody will become much more comfortable with a lot of this, and uh, I think even more excited as well. So another reason for Zebra is the efficiency that they built into this operating system, it really had the end users in mind. It's extremely intuitive, and the interfaces are much easier to use than um, tr traditional Windows. I know a lot of times when you're using a Windows CE device, the fonts can be small. Sometimes it's difficult to be able to select things. Uh, sometimes you're just using the green screen, and that's fine, but moving forward, there's a much better way to go about doing this, and you'll, you'll see the evolution of that take place. The, the newer devices also have better hardware components, so you have a much better battery life. And since the operating systems are designed to reduce processes and unnecessary background tasks, that allows for a longer battery life and that far exceeds what you would get running legacy Windows devices. Your productivity, you'll definitely see an increase in productivity as a result of these devices. They're much more ergonomic. The, the, the touch screens are very prominent. The keys are easy to select. Uh, many of the devices have a, a physical keyboard as well as a virtual keyboard on them which helps because there's many people who actually prefer the hard keys, which is fine. But you do have the option, you can go all touch as well. Uh, this particular unit on this slide is an all touch device. Probably one of the biggest and most important uh, aspects of this is security. And we mentioned that Windows CE and the Windows Mobile will no longer be releasing the security updates that is not the case with Android. They will consistently be pushing releases of operating systems. So you will have control of that as an admin. And uh, Zebra will be able to also push that bundled in with some of the Telnet clients. Um, there's a velocity for the Android, um, which is a nice app that's built in. All those things uh, come prepackaged and you can push them at will. So you can control that process. And then the migration is actually, it's not as scary as it seems. We've gone through quite a few, and it takes a little bit to get used to, but once you've done it and once you start to get the hang of it, it's like riding a bike, and it's pretty much automatic from there. So we really look forward to working uh, with our customers to help walk them through this process uh, of making the migration as easy as possible. And then finally, data capture has drastically improved on these devices. You can do the 1D, 2D barcodes. You can do simul scan, where you can scan multiple barcodes at one time. There's a suite of apps that are available uh, within the Zebra's uh, operating system that they offer that we'll get into uh, later in this call with Kevin. So why would you want to utilize Ari's Android OS Migration Professional Services. And the reason is, is because we know what we're doing. We 
have a very firm process, a tested process. Uh, we have all the certifications that are required to make a successful migration happen. Um, we have the strategic partnerships to be able to support that. Our process always begins when we're doing these migrations with the customers. We always begin with the scoping and planning. So we do the assessment for exactly where we are now and where we're trying to get. If there's anything we're going to be modernizing, uh, we make sure that we catch that in this first phase of scoping and planning because you don't want to have to go back later and rework it. Secondly, we design and then we implement the requirements for your devices, your network, uh, any design features, any workflows around your business. Thirdly, we do the testing and validation. So we make sure that we can always get a unit on the network, make sure that everything's talking correctly, uh, test all of the use cases within production, validate all the KPIs that you would expect to get, and uh, we do the acceptance testing as well. And then finally, the last step in our process for migration and onboarding our customers is the pilot training and support, which is an ongoing role. So we do provide the user training. Uh, we are available um, if you have certain service contracts with us. Uh, depending on what the service level agreement is, we can send people on site. We can help remotely. Um, we can help with optimizations and rollouts. So really, depending on how much assistance you need, we make sure that we're always there to accommodate. And as I mentioned, the modernization and the user adoption, it, it's key in this, because anytime you introduce a brand new technology, people, they, they like avoid it like the plague. You know, they kind of, they don't want to see it, they don't want to use it. And we're, we're all creatures of habit in a way. But I think after working with Lowry and, and going through a few devices or, or maybe one or two of your locations, you'll see that the process is much smoother, it's, it's streamlined, and the user adoption rate is very high. So that's going to be it for the introduction. I'm going to now pass it off to Kevin from Zebra, and he is going to get into more detail about some of those things we discussed. All righty, good deal, Nick. Thanks. And uh, look at that. All right, um, Nick, let me know that you can see my screen here. Yes. Awesome, perfect. Well, uh, hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Lowry, for this opportunity, and thank uh, all, all of you for taking the time out of your, uh, taking the time out of your busy afternoon in order to be able to uh, kind of give a listen in and find out what's going on with uh, technology as it transitions over to modern mobile. Uh, as Nick indicated, this is the first of three uh, webinars that uh, that Lowry is going to be doing. Um, in, in we're going to use this as an opportunity in order to be able to kind of set the baseline of uh, of understanding of of a couple of things. You know, our goal here today is to uh, provide you with some some good information that you could use when you're supporting the conversations uh, and supporting your businesses as far as being able to move over to a new platform. Uh, we're going to talk about you know what's happening and why things are changing. Uh, we're going to review with you you know what's going on with rugged mobile and why it's not going to be the same as days gone by with their, our legacy platforms. Uh, talk about the fact that you know those existing platforms today uh, in industrial environments are are not secure, and uh, give you some highlights as far as what you can do in order to be able to provide a secure environment around an Android platform, uh, and extend that secure environment for the longevity of the investment that you make in the hardware. And like I said earlier, we're going to, you know, provide you with a lot of, uh, you know, good referenceable information or be able to drive these uh, these conversations forward. So with that, um, I, I kind of wanted to start out with with a quote, uh, and I find this this quote very intriguing um, because it, it it really states, you know, kind of the way things are today and the way we feel today. 
uh, in many cases. Um, it follows that the acceleration in the rate of change will result in an increasing need for reorganization, right? So change for change sakes is going to result in change. This change is usually feared primarily because it means a disturbance of the status quo. Uh, that it's going to threaten people's vested interests in their jobs. This could be, you know, it's going to change the, change our established ways of doing things. And for these reasons, this adoption of change is often deferred with a resulting loss in effectiveness and an increase in cost. Uh, the thing I find interesting about this quote is it's not a new problem, right? This is uh, something that, that came up over 500 years ago with you know with the adoption of different ways of doing things and better business practices and so on um and i, I thought this is a, a kind of a, a brilliant observation in order to be able to level set uh the conversation that we're going to have today you know the fact is that change is inevitable and that change is an ongoing uh evolution that uh, that's not going to go away. You know, it's a, it's interesting that this is you know was first identified as a 500 year old problem, and here we are, you know, sitting here in a you know in the 21st century, still dealing with the same kind of uh, core issues around it. So that being said, you know, just to kind of level set, um, you know, understanding that that change is happening. You know, let's talk about what happened and 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 what now and and why that this change is going to impact the way that we have to do things in the future. And there's a lot of different influences that are, that are, uh, that are really defining the way that businesses uh, have to perform. Uh, if you look at uh, what all, you know, and I'm sure a lot of other people, what uh, a lot of other people refer to as the Amazon effect, right? The fact that um, e-commerce is demanding uh, a change in the way logistics operates, right? Uh, the on-demand economy is really redefining not only uh, a consumer experience of how supply chain should operate, but also, you know, it's it's feeding back into business and how our uh, suppliers need to operate. And you know, it's it's nothing new in a lot of uh, in, in a lot of different markets. You know, you look at automotive, you know, just-in-time delivery. That's pretty much what's defined uh, the way, you know, consumer expectations are derived, but we're seeing this impact, you know, basically everything in the supply chain now. Um, what's what's interesting here is the dates. So if we look at, you know, the demand for labor, you know, just because uh, automation is going to be more prevalent, it doesn't mean it's gonna eliminate labor. You know, if you look at market studies uh, in the US and India, UK, and other countries, and so on, they all indicate that there is going to be a much higher demand for labor uh, come this 2020, 2021, 2022 timeframe. Um, you know, our goal here is to think about ways to improve efficiencies with the labor that we have in order to be able to minimize the impacts of additional staffing that's going to be required to, to take on some of this inevitability and in how uh, logistics is going to change in the near future. You know, the other aspect um, that's impacting a lot of decisions, if any uh, if any of you on this call happen to have any uh, requirements for uh, continual connectivity while outside the four walls, you know, utilizing a cellular network, there's a lot of change being driven by the carriers here domestically. You know, you look at Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile, they, uh, most of them have announced that they are going to be turning down their 2G and 3G networks in favor of LTE uh, come that 2020 and 2022 timeframe as well. So, you know, first off, there's gonna be a big demand and force change in labor requirements. There's gonna be a big demand and in, in force change in uh, outside the four walls connectivity. It's going to require, uh, you know, eventual replacement of some of these devices that are out there. Uh, the other aspect that's interesting to note is our end users experience with mobile technology is being defined by their outside of work experience, right? Uh, the, the mobile devices that we put in the hands of our users today are drastically mis mismatched from the way they expect technology to behave. Uh, and if you look at this from a global perspective, we see that 
uh, uh, iOS and, uh, and Android here are really defining uh, expectations on how stuff is supposed to work. Uh, those of you that have legacy platforms deployed in your environment know for a fact that it takes quite a while to bring up a new user with older technology. Um, you know, you've, you've probably seen your training times extend. You've seen some of the non-intuitive nature of these legacy platforms have a direct impact on uh, overall employee of adoption of applications. Uh, what's, what's more to note here is uh, towards the, actually towards the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018, the overall impact of Windows mobile Windows CE, Windows handheld as an operating system has been minimal. Um, in fact, going into 2018, it was less than 0.012% of the global population was, you know, had any sort of experience or interaction with this new mobile platform. So, uh, you know, now is an opportunity for us to be able to look at that, the way that in our, our end users are experiencing technology and, and work towards redefining and improve that end user's experience with the applications. Uh, I find this study rather interesting, uh, especially you know, my, my former lives as a, a developer. Um, what this study basically says, this was done by VDC a while back, and it basically says that, uh, you know, kind of summarizing everything, that 59% of all the, uh, of, of the, uh, applications in the hand of our users today are are less than satisfactory uh, which to me as a developer or me as a uh, an ops manager causes me to set up and, and take note because to me uh, again as a developer I would consider myself as a developer a failure if only 41 percent of my end users were satisfied or very satisfied with my application um, this is due to the fact uh, in this uh, in this previous slide here. This is due to the fact that everybody's new uh, way of experiencing applications is derived from their outside of work experience, and it's really working hard to um, you know to refine the set of expectations. So you know we've got a huge, tremendous opportunity here in order to be able to modernize that work experience and improve productivity and improve end user satisfaction with these applications going forward. Uh, as, as Nick mentioned earlier, uh, we've got a lot of the legacy devices that are out there that uh, you know, support is, is indeed coming to an end uh, on that platform. Uh, another one that Nick alluded to as well is the fact uh, that extended support is retiring. Uh, what is important to note here is when you look at these dates, 2015, 2013, 2016, 2012, mainstream support by Microsoft has already been retired. Uh, you know, basically what that means is that do not expect any proactive support coming from Microsoft for the patch release and so on. This extended support uh, retire date means that Microsoft is gonna say, you know, no more. It's time to move off to something, uh, something else, and something new. So, uh, I just wanted to to kind of reinforce the fact that you know when we look at these dates, they're 18 months out. So, knowing that you know we we do have to make a change, knowing that we do have to make uh, an evolution, uh, you know, knowing that we do have an opportunity here in order to be able to improve the overall workers' experience with our applications, it, the time is kind of you know coalescing to like now is the time to really start uh, getting a move uh, on this uh, on this platform as well. Uh, one of the things that 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 you know the industry has really held out hope for is uh, you know is this focus around uh, you know what's going to come from Microsoft next. Uh, you know early on it was you know Windows Phone 7 was going to be the next mobile platform, and then it was Windows Phone 8 and 8.1, and um, uh, you know some of the manufacturers came out with Windows Mobile 8.1 platforms, and then Microsoft goes, well eh, we're going to do something a little bit different, and you know there was some you know, allusion to, uh, you know, some alluding to, I guess, to, uh, you know, Windows 9, and they say, oh, we're gonna skip that, we're gonna go to Windows 10. 
um, you know, when Windows 10 platform was a big promise until about October of last year, um, where Joe Bellafor, their CIO for their mobile platform architecture said, you know, uh, in, and again, referenceable articles, um, you know, that uh, Joe Bellafor said that, you know, the software part is no longer going to be, uh, they're no longer going to be developing features. Basically, Windows 10 Mobile is going on life support, uh, it, which which is good. Um, you know, it's it's kind of indicative of a of a lower overall market share and things like that. What Microsoft, um, I'm sorry, what Microsoft was intelligent in doing now, in again, you know, compare this to the your, your outside of work experience. What they've been investing in is providing a Microsoft application experience regardless of the underlying platform. So think about it, things like Microsoft Office or Excel or Word or PowerPoint or whatever, you can do that on your Android phone. You can do that on your Android tablet. You can even do that on, on your iOS tablet. Um, you know, the same thing with uh, Microsoft Business Dynamics or Microsoft Intune is now supporting these other platforms and so on. Their end game here, is providing a Microsoft-centric experience regardless of the underlying operating system platform of the device itself. Um, you know, just another point of reference, Microsoft made over $6 billion in 2016 of licensing their platforms to run on other uh, operating systems. So it's, uh, you know, it's pretty telling. Um, so, you know, we, at Zebra kind of saw this coming. Um, you know, we had uh, some, some, you know, challenges and learnings, you know, listening to a mobile direction from Microsoft back in 2010, you know, it was gonna be Windows 8.1, but also realizing the fact that they were gonna limit the manufacturers and the OEMs as far as what additional features they can add to it. They didn't want to account for an external keyboard. They, you know, they didn't want to give the, the, the people like us, the OEMs, uh, access to the Wi-Fi stack in order to be able to make our improvements when it comes to roaming and load balancing and, and assuring, you know, a, a stellar Wi-Fi experience with the device itself. So, uh, you know, we heard what was Microsoft was doing. Um, you know, we made a big risky bet uh, back in 2011 by coming, out, coming to market with the first uh, rugged industrial Android platform. Um, you know, our friends and in, in, uh, in comrades over there in, in Redmond weren't too happy about it. However, uh, it allowed us to develop a new relationship. Uh, and, and with this relationship, it allowed us to move even faster. And if you remember back in 2011, Android was relatively new. Android didn't really have a whole lot of market share, but when you look at it from, you know, taking a step back, it was the only open, operating system out there that allowed OEMs and other vendors within the industry to consume and develop on and iterate and improve. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, early on, Android was not secure. So we added security, um, ways to control the user experience, uh, mobility extensions like MX that allowed for on uh, on device encryption or hiding, you know, the Wi-Fi keys and things like that. Something that that's standard in. Android didn't do. So we made it secure, we made it manageable, something again that consumer variants of Android weren't uh, integrated within Sodi and in AirWatch platforms and mobile iron and so on, made it more manageable, uh, made it easier to deploy and so on. We added a whole lot of tools, uh, a developer kit in order to be able to reach deep into our hardware platforms and extract maximum value and productivity, productivity from it. We added things like an enterprise class browser. So if you are doing web app uh, integration, you have an industrialized browser in a manageable form factor that allows you to do so. Uh, you know, working with partners like Lowry, providing ways to ease transition going from uh, especially native code in, in C Sharp or .NET moving at Android. Uh, we have an EMDK specifically for our devices to, to lever things like the barcode scanner and the radio and, and, and uh, controls of the, the user interface and so on. And provided a, a plugin into Xamarin uh, 
Um, you know, the other thing that Microsoft did is they bought Xamarin uh, back in 2017, 2016, uh, in order to be able to basically provide a plugin into Visual Studio developer environment to give them a cross-platform IDE. So now Microsoft has, through Visual Studio, a way to create applications that run not only on their Windows platforms, but also on Android or even to a degree iOS. Uh, you know, it's a brilliant move. Again, their you know uh, their positioning as far as you know give the give everybody a Microsoft experience regardless of the underlying platform. Uh, we added. Uh, as of last year, this lifecycle management called Lifeguard, and we continue to add utilities to add value to the platform itself. So, the purpose of this is to is to illustrate the fact that we've been doing this a long time. Uh, there's been a lot of learnings in this. Uh, you know, this is not our first evolution. This is not our first uh, you know rodeo per se. Uh, I started in the business back in the mid 80s, you know, and, and at that time we had proprietary development environments on proprietary operating systems for specific, you know, terminals, um, which then evolved into the, you know, the, the beginnings of, of DOS as an operating system on a mobile device, which then evolved into Pocket PC, which was Microsoft's first iteration or first dip in the water when it came to de delivering a mobile device. There was Palm for a while and we've had this long row a uh, long road here with you know Windows CE, Windows Mobile, but that's that's another evolution. So uh, you know the, this evolution that we're experiencing now is not an evolution that we haven't been through before. Uh, the good news is 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 that we're providing a framework and a set of platforms uh, and toolkits that has you know a good seven years of development in behind them in order to be able to get us to the point that we are today which is adopting, you know, tremendous Android growth. Um, again, you know, uh, for, first platform that we came out with was a tablet back in 2011, but, you know, we know that there are different form factors and different user requirements based on the many different use cases that are used in your environments that are out there. Everything from, uh, you know, from, from a, a handheld gun style form factor, for example, to a traditional handheld, uh, PDA like device into tablets and even vehicle mounts. You know, we've got an ecosystem of devices that are out there. And along with that, as I indicated on a previous slide, we've got a long legacy of, of refinement in applications that are delivered in order to be able to uh, to enhance the overall workflow overall on these platforms. And we're seeing the industry adopt. We're seeing a lot of movement um, toward, from, or I should say, a lot of movement away from our traditional brick and key type of devices into something that is more of an all-touch experience. The reason being is this is what our end users want. Uh, they want a seamless transition from their outside of work experience with a mobile device to their inside of work experience with a mobile device. And this transition is happening now. Uh, we are seeing, you know, accelerated adoption of these uh, of these uh, these handheld devices overall. So, you know, right now, right now, this, you know, when you look at the big picture, this is disruptive, right? It is causing us to sit back and take note and, uh, you know, kind of reassess or re-architect the way we do business today. But it's also a, a very long-term positive move uh, of evolution because you know it gives us a chance right now to look at how can I make things better for my end users? How can I integrate larger screens and and, and simplify or, or or reduce the friction of, of of their experience with a mobile application, while at the same time giving ourselves as administrators of these platforms, ways to increase the management and security, uh, ways to deliver cross-platform OS agnostic application frameworks, and ways to incorporate um, a BI into business, uh, business intelligence or business analytics into the process in order to be able to help drive efficiencies within my platforms. And that's that's really where, you know, a partnership with Lowry, uh, you know, really comes to shine on a lot of these things. Uh, 
So that kind of set the stage, uh, you know, level set where we're at today and why things are happening now. Um, and let's talk a little bit about why we need to behave as an industry differently. And when I say why we as an industry, I'm talking, you know, just I'm talking beyond Zebra. Um, we're all in this boat together. Uh, and, and again, as I talked to earlier, it's all because of this, this influence of, you know, consumerization and how we have to take the old way of doing things into a new modality of interacting with technology. Um, you know, it, it can kind of use the word confluence in two ways, right? A coming together, uh, the old with the new, but also, you know, I kind of like the term this as the consumer influence in how industry we as manufacturers have to behave. Uh, we, 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 we have to perform this way, but the value that we bring to the table is we have, we do this, we deliver these platforms without compromising the integrity of an enterprise class mobile device that we've you know learned over the last 25 years of doing this. Where if you look at a lot of consumer platforms, they don't think about things like this, you know, like an iOS device or a Samsung device, for example. It, they don't think about what it takes to manage a battery in a device because as far as they're concerned, when the battery's done, you go get a new device. There's no mechanism to change the battery or to charge it, or there's there's not even a there's not even forethought put into the design of the device that it's going to last, you know, eight to ten hours of continuous use in an industrial environment. Okay, and that's that's kind of key. That's something that we think about uh, when we talk about rugged mobile computing. Um, you look at the the other devices that are in market. A lot of them don't consider the fact that this is a multi-user thing. You know, somebody more, you know, somebody more than one person is going to use it. There's no requirement to set up a Google e Gmail account on it, for example, because I don't want my users doing it. Um, that's the type of mindset that we take when we're looking at these things. Uh, those of you that have, you know, either an Android or an iOS device that ever left it in a hot car, or you know, left it in a in a sun while you were doing yard work or whatever, you know, you've come back to look at it and you either saw the yellow triangle or the fact that the device has to shut down because it's too hot. Um, that doesn't work in an industrial environment because it does get hot and they do get left in cabs and they are used on the road and, and so on. So, uh, you know, that type of durability, uh, you know, temperature cycle and so on are all things that we think of. Um, and finally, the accessory ecosystem. Uh, we know that deploying these devices in the hands of our users, you have to put sometimes some gadgets in around with it could be a trigger handle, it could be a charger, it could be a cable, it could be a cradle, whatever. Um, again, you know, other manufacturers, other consumer variants don't consider this. Um, you know, those of you that went through the iPhone 4 to iPhone 5 challenge, uh, you know, where your 30 pin connector got up, sleeted in favor of the lightning connector. Um, it, it, gave me personal heartburn because I had to go buy new cables. But, you know, could you imagine a, a, an enterprise that made investment in, you know, 500 or 1,000 of these devices, all of a sudden has to go out and buy new stuff, new sleds, new batteries, et cetera. It, it, it doesn't fly. So, again, uh, this is a very important aspect to consider when you're looking at a move to new technology. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but this is just for a point of your reference. Uh, as far as people that have gone the consumer path and have realized the error uh, of their ways and uh, and made some uh, some some changes in the way that they uh, that they consider acquisition of these devices and so on. The thing is, the thing that's important to realize is that now there is a common ecosystem uh, from a support and deployment standpoint that you can use within your enterprise organizations to deploy, be it a handheld device or a wearable device or even a vehicle. Common operating system platform, common operating system variants, common ways of deployment management and security for these platforms going forward. And, and really that's where our, our, our value as Zebra comes into play. When we look at um, the devices, you know, it's good to have the devices, but knowing the fact that these devices are going to be uh, used in a couple of different ways, the accessory ecosystem 
is important. And, and for those of you that have, uh, that have been very uh, familiar with, with a, a Zebra, you know, symbols, Motorola Zebra experience is that as we iterate new platforms, we do our darndest to be able to, to lever the existing, uh, uh, the existing accessory ecosystem to progress you forward. Uh, but with this new platform, it's given us additional capability, uh, additional value add, additional ways to enhance worker productivity through improvements that we make in the management interface, the user interface, and the utilities that we provide on top of it. Uh, for example, I'll pick on one here, Simulscan. Uh, think of it, uh, think of it as a way to capture multiple barcodes with a single press of the trigger and then parse those all those barcodes that were read into the appropriate data fields within your application. That's huge. That has a significant impact on overall worker productivity. So rather, you know, for those of you in automotive that have to scan an AIAG shipping label, it's got what five or six different fields on it. Generally it's you know it's a bleep, bleep, bleep all at the same time you're trying to cover the hidden cover and hide barcodes you don't want to cover uh, scan with your hand, for example. With Simulscan, it's a bleep and it'll parse out the, the date code and a, a supplier country or country of all origin, a supplier ID, the part number, and the serial number, all to those appropriate data fields. That's huge. Um, you know, it shaves seconds off of each transaction. Um, and then finally, solutions that we can add on top of this. You know, for example, being able to uh, use a solution that we have around uh, Workforce Connect Push to Talk Pro, which basically turns these devices into uh, communication platforms. Uh, think of it as being able to provide your workers with a Nextel-like experience in the mobile devices that they have in their hands today. So uh, again, there, there's, 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 there's so much additional value that could be derived from these more modern platforms going forward. And I do want to touch on, uh, you know, uh, impacts on overall user experience and productivity. Uh, we did it. You know, we did our own internal study, basically taking a terminal emulation application and modernizing it into a more touch-centric way, without having to change the backend TE server itself. Um, you know, we found that it, it resulted in in lower error rates, uh, gains in productivity, because we were ba basically able to take a green screen experience. You know, if you've ever seen the menu screen, you type in a number one, you press the enter key. Well, rather than showing them the menu, press the one and then the enter key, why not just show them big buttons on the test that they want to accomplish? Uh, you know, do a pick application, you push the pick application button and you're within the pick application. As far as the host is concerned, it saw the number one followed by the, you know, the field exit key, which is precisely what the, you know, what that old iron wants to see. Um, you know, huge gains in productivity. The thing that I found really surprising was the increase in typing speed. Uh, the reason being, you know, and think about it, uh, for any of you that have, uh, you know, uh, up and coming millennials or millennials, or, you know, even yourself as a millennial, you, you can physically type on your screen uh, in an intelligent way uh, without having to index your fingers on the screen. Right. Uh, if you ever sat down to dinner with your kids, you know they're typing away on their on their um, you know, on their phones while they're having a conversation with you, not even looking at the screen. Uh, I found that statistic kind of you know kind of, you know, kind of uh, awe-inspiring. But you know when I thought about it, yeah, that's kind of the way things are happening today. Uh, plus, you know, think about the way that the keyboards are laid out on our traditional devices. They're not intuitive. It's not a QWERTY layout. It's an ABC layout. So, you know, these little, uh, the, these little advantages that, that this modern technology brings to the table, like I said, have overall significant impacts to productivity at large. So, so we talked about the why. We talked about the what happens when you do uh, when you do move, but you know, one of the big things that that we in the industry hear about all the time is the fact uh, that there has been a lot of press, early press, I should say, that Android is really not a secure environment. Number one, number two, is how do I uh, provide a secure environment 
for the long haul. You know, and you guys make investment in technology for, you know, you don't expect to replace it every 48 to 36 months. You expect it to last, you know, uh, you, you know, five, seven, or even beyond years, right? And we, as as purveyors to the industry, create devices that last that long. Uh, so I kind of wanted to touch around this as far as, you know, security. Uh, we know, uh, and again, you know, we've grown up along with, with all of y'all, is that security is paramount, regardless of the underlying vertical that we look at. Um, you know, be it healthcare, T&L, manufacturing, retail, and so on. You know, there's all Every one of these industries has some sort of compliance requirement around security um, uh, to a degree. What's even more interesting is, you know, is is assuring security for the long haul, right? We know who, you know, did a survey of our customers. We know that the majority of our customers plan to keep, uh, you know, devices for well more than five years which is, you know, it's pretty telling. You, know, you want to squeeze the asset until you can get every nickel of investment that you, you know, that you make into it. And, you know, this, this survey result kind of still continues to iterate that fact. Um, Five-year uh, investment in technology is, is kind of key. When you look at, uh, when you look at what's happening in the consumer place, uh, they're trying uh, you know, offering upgrades and things like that, but it doesn't protect the initial investment that you make in technology. Um, you know, it's it's not what our enterprise customers seem to want from a consumer perspective. Now, we know that a secure environment is required. And when you look at what Zebra does, that's different from everybody else. We take a look at security through a couple of different lenses, right? One around prevention. How do we keep bad things from happening in the first place? Um, uh, we build in utilities, you know, part of our extensions, part of the value add that we bring to the Android platform is to prevent users from, you know, from doing no, uh, from doing harm. Uh, if a harmful application can act, execute, it can't do harm. If a user can't go to a place that they shouldn't go to, it can't do harm. Um, you know, let's provide tight controls through the integration platforms that we have with the MDM providers to you know tighten that control overall. So you know, we got prevention licked uh, to a degree. Don't let end users go to places they shouldn't go. They can't get into applications they shouldn't run. Uh, in the event that they uh, that something bad does happen, in the event that um, uh, uh, for example, end users are smart. Uh, they know how, you know, they may know how to get into an application. We'll do our darndest to keep them locked out of it. Um, but for example, if somebody finds one of your devices on the side of a road because it fell off the back, back of a truck, that device could still have some valuable information in there about your Wi-Fi network. It could have valuable information about a uh, a, a transaction or a, a shipping manifest or something, right? You don't want that to get in the hands of somebody else. We can detect if, uh, if for example, somebody tries to root the device and, and gain access to the file system. If that happens, let's go ahead and wipe the device. Let's remove all the, all the pertinent information off of there. Or if it, uh, for example, if it does fall off the back of the truck and, you know, and somebody does pick it up, they really can't do anything because we're preventing them from doing something. Um, you know, in the event that it doesn't touch a Wi-Fi network within a defined period of time, we can go ahead and wipe the device or even turn it to a known good state that all it knows how to do is connect to your network and connect to your MDM server in order to be able to download the latest updates. That's all it knows how to do. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, having a uh, a mechanism in order to be able to provide security updates is is first and foremost important uh, overall. When we look at security, um, actually, when 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 the Department of Homeland Security looks at security, uh, they, they did a phenomenal job of of really looking at the different 
uh, ways that a mobile device can expose security threats within an organization. And for those of you that want to get some more additional detail on that, there's a great report here uh, that's been published. It's 150 some odd pages long, but I'll just give you the highlights. If you want to go into the gory details, go ahead and, and, and do so. I really thought it was a fascinating read, but basically what they did is they looked at mobile devices, looked at the, the ways that a device can be uh, vulnerable, you know, through the mobile technology, mobile networks, or the applications, and so on, and then looked at each of the vectors within each of those surfaces uh, to determine, you know, what's the best way to get around some of these potential exploits. You know, and at the end of the day, they basically determined that, you know, exploits are inevitable. But if you want to assure a secure environment, the most important defense against threats is to ensure the devices are patched against publicly known security vulnerabilities. So number one, have a patch strategy and, and execute on it. Number two, when you're making procurement decisions for devices themselves, you should always seek clear commitment from the vendors or the mobile carriers that security updates will be provided in a timely manner. And that's what we do as part of our lifeguard security uh, patch strategy uh, is it, it's predictable and we provide that so you know we're, we're committed to do that and uh, when a device is no longer supported but with these updates you should decommission those and consider something new and that's that's all well and good but um, you know I think the, the fact of the matter is is we live in a different world these days you know vulnerabilities are out there and they go beyond the operating system itself. You know, if you look at the more recent ones, uh, WannaCry was uh, the ransomware attack that, you know, uh, created a couple of organizations with, uh, uh, with devices, but basically it was because workers were going to places where they shouldn't go, right? They got, they got themselves infected to a degree. We can help manage that through things, you know, utilities that we have like enterprise home screen. But if you look at Blueborn, Crack, Spectre, and Meltdown, uh, all of those vulnerabilities are beyond the operating system. So uh, an iOS device, an Android device, even your Windows 8, uh, you know, Windows 7 devices are all susceptible to these vulnerabilities unless you had a patch strategy. Um, ARM devices within Windows Mobile and Windows CE are susceptible to Spectre and Meltdown. Um, there is no patch strategy for those platforms. So, um, you know, it's it's updates in, in the days of a golden image operating system are, they're, they're, they're days gone by. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is in order to be able to provide a truly secure mobile environment for your operations, it's important to have a patch strategy along that. Um, uh, you know, just to touch on a couple of them, you know, for example, this extended support that Microsoft, that we're under with Windows Mobile and Windows CE does not mean security assurance. For example, if you have a requirement in your organization in order to be able to support, uh, and actually this should read uh, TLS, Transport Layer Security version 1.2, it ain't going to happen. Um, they're already not operating, offering any patches for these new vulnerabilities like Spectre. Uh, again, another link at the bottom of the page and a quote, Microsoft may be unable to provide security updates for older products, leaving them at risk in the face of more demanding security requirements. So uh, if that doesn't help uh, help refine the importance of security, uh, you know, I think, I think it really does. You know, the thing is about Android, is early on it was uh, you know as indicated as insecure um you know and it was you know pretty much uh, you know in front of everybody's faces in a in a press like you know this this headline stage fright puts over a billion android devices at risk which was true uh, you know they were at risk but in the wild it wasn't a field exploit it was something that was done in a lab and so on but you know the fact of the matter is 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 that it was identified and patched and deployed in a timely manner android is a very secure environment uh, it's based on actually based on a secure, a security enhanced edition of linux um, it does some tricky things within the way it runs in order to be able to prevent people from injecting places into uh, injecting code into places uh, on a regular basis. Uh, it is compliant with a lot of the industry regulations that are out there. 
So uh, again, and, you know, I got some great references here for for having a conversation with people that think that Android is not a secure environment, which leads us into, uh, you know, why having a patch strategy is important. So we talked about the importance of security. We talked about the fact that people, enterprises want to hang on to their uh, hardware for a long time, uh, which means that we have to provide a secure environment throughout the five plus years of use. And that's where LifeGuard from Zebra comes into play. Um, you know, we manufacture devices for the long haul. You make investments of technology to be used to provide productive operation in your organizations for the long haul, right? So, so yes, we're in this together. Uh, but what LifeGuard does is, is, you know, when we come out with products, you know, we manufacture them for the long haul, and we'll eventually announce a end of sale kind of in the middle of these arrows here and then go into a, a long haul support mechanism for this, right? So we'll provide hardware support for these devices. So when we go end of sale for a given platform, we will continue to provide security patches and updates for that last running operating system that was released on this device for a period of 24 months after that device goes end of sale. That's something that nobody else in the market is going to do. The other thing that we do is provide security while you transition. Knowing that there's a big churn in operating systems and so on, knowing that enterprises can't move at the speed of consumer, uh, we provide a mechanism that will provide uh, updates and security patches for a predecessor variant of an operating system while you evaluate the next generation operating system. So in a sense, you've got a year to test, deploy, evaluate, and, and whatever the next version of an operating system while still continuing to protect your existing environment. And then we do so, we, we, you know, we release these patches in a predictable manner either monthly or quarterly, uh, and these updates are not pushed automatically by us. They are provided by you. You make a decision as far as when you want to deploy these updates. The, the, the great news about this patch strategy, the security strategy, is it is an uh, it, it's 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 an entitlement within a Zebra One Care maintenance agreement. Right? You, you, it comes with the program. So as long as you have a Zebra One Care or whatever protecting the hardware investment that you make, you get this additional lifeguard support as well. And you might think, well, that's all well and good, but what about you know after 24 months? Well, we offer very long-term options that allow you to extend the the usable viability in a secure manner. Uh, those devices by uh, these long-term security patch and updates options, right? So, so Kevin, to, to the layman, you're essentially saying that you can double the life cycle of these devices. You can extend the life cycle up to the uh, the end of service date on any of these platforms. That is correct. I wouldn't go far as say double finger quotes in the air, but you can you can provide some extended support to these as well. So, yeah, great observation. You know, the, the thing about LifeGuard is is not only is it predictable, you know, we fall in, you know, in lockstep with Google and their, their vulnerability release, assessed releases and get those patches out there. But there's also those zero day vulnerabilities like, you know, the Blueborn Spectres and meltdowns and cracks and so on that happen. And, and we patch immediately and we, we might get an out of cycle patch on there. But... You know, those are event-driven uh, things that we take a look at. So, you know, really at the end of the day, we have a strategy in place to extend the, the, the service life of these products in a secure manner going forward, knowing that our customers use these things longer than five years. We understand that enterprise can't move at the speed of consumer when it comes to going from one variant of an operating system to the next. We'll provide patches in a secure manner in order to be able to help ease that migration strategy. And knowing that vulnerabilities aren't going away, knowing that we have to operate in a new way, uh, we are working to provide a, an aggressive and predictable patch strategy for you to assure that you are running in a secure environment. And as of March of this year, 
We've had over 20,000 downloads from you know over 5,600 unique entities, customers, end users, and so on, that have adopted and deployed this strategy going forward. You know, really, Zebra's approach here is to provide transformed ability for the warehouse and operations of the future. Uh, we see Android as a mechanism, a modern way of of, uh, of getting us to that platform. And you know, just in summary, you know, uh, to, to reiterate a couple points, you know, we got to get past the Windows Mobile, Windows CE stuff. We got to get beyond our legacy. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to improve and partnering. You know, you guys partnering with Lowry to overall uh, refactor the way you do business. You know, the market direction is clear. It is Android. In fact, uh, one of our closest competitors finally jumped on the Android bandwagon full commitment two feet in the fire in October of last year when Microsoft said that they're not doing the Windows Mobile thing. So, you know, the, the market direction beyond us is clear. It is Android. And we've been doing this stuff a long time. There's a lot of additional value add on the platforms that we bring to the table. So with that, Nick, uh, it brings us near the top of the hour. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to you and, uh, and see how you want to close out here. Yeah, so um, if, if anybody uh, has questions, just feel free to go to lariesolutions.com slash Android. There's a contact form. Uh, you can contact us that way. There's lots of good information there, and we'll have someone reach out to you. And then just on closing, um, there's one, one uh, OS migration to Android that wasn't referenced, and uh, it was actually someone I know uh, went from Apple of 15 years to Android. And, and to get that migrated, all I had to do was have my wife go to Verizon, showed her why it was charging and the back button on an Android, and she immediately switched to uh, Samsung from Apple. I call that a successful migration. Yeah, yeah amen. Yep, absolutely. All right. Thanks so much, Kevin, and thanks, everyone, for attending. We do have another event. And then uh, finally, we'll have a third one, and those dates are going to be for the next one. It's going to be September 19th, and it's going to be OS migration, a look ahead. So you, you want to come to that one prepared, kind of take inventory in your environment, some use cases if, you, if you'd like to bounce some questions off us. And then the third and final one will be October 17th, and that is developing an OS migration strategy, your roadmap to success. So that's when we really get specific. So something to keep in mind, and we will make sure that we uh, get the, the registration emailed out to you. And again, thanks everyone for attending, and we'll see you on the next one.